This week on CISO Talks, we're going to do something a bit different. So over the last few years, we've had over 30 interviews with security professionals and CISOs. So we wanted to take a few minutes just to reflect back on some of the running themes that we've seen throughout these interviews. One thing that we've seen time and time again from interviews with both Joseph Carson and James Gopal is just how difficult it is sometimes to get the board to understand the seriousness of cybersecurity and how difficult it is to get budgets assigned for such projects. Yeah, this is a major challenge today for many CISOs, is going to the board and you know, giving their, their, their use cases and giving the request for budget. And in many cases, they're getting the, the lowest end of the budget or even not getting the budget increase that they need. And it's really kind of a shame because many organizations is the problem is it's really about effective communication and, and the failure from the CISO to communicate in a business value or business language. Um, I've been involved in a number of CISOs, you know, going to the board and actually requesting for budget increase. And I learned myself from making mistakes. What I found was that when, I, when we were going to the board and we were actually presenting fear, we were talking about technology, we were talking about threats, we were talking about cyber attacks. We were talking about the things that actually didn't reflect and wasn't uh, seen as tangible directly to the business. There were things that the business was worried about and, and, and knew that they needed to do something about, but it didn't reflect a return on investment. It didn't have the really understanding about, you know, how does it help the business? And I mean, this, we hear this, we hear this a lot. Absolutely. You know, I mean, we saw one organization, uh, obviously we can't name, mm -hmm. um, that it allegedly spent more on coffee than the <laughs> IT security budget. So Sometimes it's it. not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, well, that's probably consumed by the IT department actually drinking the coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> if they increase the budget, maybe there'll be less coffee spent because they're not working around the clock. That's good. Um, that's good. Do you think boards in general understand the risks of cybersecurity and data security in general? No, I don't. I, I, I think there's, there have been big pushes over the last couple of years for boards to become more involved. It's typically has been treated as a, uh, as something that the board, um, approaches at, at best by talking to their technical teams. But in reality, you know, most of the time the board really just doesn't get that involved. It's, it's an intimidating topic for a lot of folks and we need a better way of communicating with them. Um, I, I think that the technical people really have been expecting the board to come to them and, and to learn the technology pieces. And what we really need is for the technical folks to understand the business side too and, and be able to broker a better communication that way. Yeah. So, so, so do, you think it's, do you think that that's sort of more the fault of the boards or more the fault of the CISOs? <laughs> um, I think it, it actually falls both. For, for both. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It, it's, um, the, the board doesn't know what to ask for, really. Uh, it, this is just something that's completely unfamiliar for them. So they, they don't know what to ask for. And the CISOs, by the, by the same token, most of them have come up through the technical ranks. And so the idea of understanding the business pieces just really doesn't, doesn't make as much sense for them. It's not, not the world that they're used to living in. So it, it's just a product of the times, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that there are ways of making that more real and making it so that it can actually happen in a, in a productive way. Another theme we've seen time and time again is the stress that are being put on CISOs. And we see this being expressed in terms of their mental health and their tenure. We spoke to Jane Franklin and she was talking how difficult it was for security professionals to escape the loneliness quite often they face in this, in this role as well. One thing that comes up time and time again when mm. we're talking to CISOs is how lonely the role can feel sometimes. Yes. Um, where can CISOs go to, to actually kind of, you know, learn, get useful, good information that isn't vendor driven as well? Well, um, it's interesting you say that. So a lot of CISOs come, they will come to me. So sure. I'm sometimes known as a bit of a therapist. <laughs> um, so they will come to me, but there are also groups yeah. um, out there that they can go and connect with all right. over all over the world. Yeah. So each kind of country. Well, like ISSA, these kind of things. I wouldn't or, actually. Yeah. I really? wouldn't point them in those those directions. Okay. No, there are there are more like you've got Club CISO in the UK. Mm. You've got um, a CISO organisation in Australia. And those are just two that I can mm, think of, mm, you know, off the top of my head. But yeah. and we also spoke to Joseph Carson about just how the tenure is so short for CISOs as well. Key question, really. What's your advice to CISOs uh, on handling stress and pressure when it comes from uh, different facets of the business? And this is probably one of the biggest challenges we've got in the industry is around, you know, 
a lot of scissors burning out, uh, you know, very quickly um, over a you know, space of 18 months, even even shorter in some cases. Um, yeah, mental health is is growing in the industry just because of the the, the stress levels. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's cyber attacks never sleep. They're they're always 24 seven happening all the time. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the, the business, you know, people who's actually responding to those do need the rest. They do need the downtime. They do need the balance. And unfortunately, because of that lack of budget and lack of resources. Um, the IT security team and the CISO are basically sometimes working around the clock just to keep the business going. And I would recommend, you know, organizations that um, at the end of the day, if you hadn't had an incident or a ransomware attack, go and shake the IT security team's hand, give them the pat on the back, because we also fail to recognize them when things are working. We fail to appreciate them when things are just working normally. And this is an area that, you know, with, with this, the increased level of stress, and in my job, um, I will never forget moments of my life where stress was at its highest level. And it made me realize sometimes what's the most, you know, impact of things and, and when I don't need to worry and when I do need to worry. Another theme we've seen come up time and time again with many of our guests is how we're forgetting the basics, how we're spending all of this time and all of this money, and yet we're still having issues with breaches just because of some fundamental qu- problems that can quite often be fixed. We were talking to Eliza May about this and Greg van der Gast is regularly talking about this as well. Oh, well, I think like you're a lot further forward in security if you, if you concentrate on the basics mm. um, and add on the fancy bits later. <laughs> Seriously. What do you define as fancy bits? What, what, what do you mean by fancy bits? Um, if you patch, for example, great. But deploying like a fancy EDR tool to tell you when some processes has run on a computer. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. Do that later. If you've got nothing in place, do that later. That Class that as a fancy bit. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. If you patch that system, do that first. Yeah. So people will put like endpoint protection on a system that's fundamentally insecure anyway. Why? I think, I think we're dealing with things at a very uh, too far downstream once it's just gotten reactive. And you, you see that in tooling choices, you see that in hiring choices. We've just not addressed the root causes and now we're juggling a million things. And we need big teams and we need all kinds of monitoring and response and, and that kind of tooling. And I think a lot of that is, um, uh, I used to think it was about having more structure and you, you absolutely need that structure, but you're not gonna get traction to it until you have uh, a engagement basically because the engagement is going to give you the visibility to know what people are doing and what you actually need to address uh, both you know in terms of the people actually doing the work your your basic employees Mm. but it's also going to help you build the relationships and get stuff done so that you're not stuck at the end of the project where hey we've done the functional requirements but there's a thousand security issues that I now have to build controls around. Another emerging trend that we've seen over recent years is the usage of virtual CSOs. We were speaking to Chris about this, and he has some really interesting points on this topic. One of the the things that I immediately think is, you know, how well can you know that organization if you're not the CSO that's in the offices? I mean, is that a challenge or is that a benefit or is that a disadvantage? Yeah, it's uh, like you said, it can kind of be it can be a little bit of both. Um, Mm. It definitely is a challenge. And that's, Mm. uh, you know, we're we were founded on the idea of the virtual CISO. And I, you know, without making it a it's but it's our so from the get go, we knew, okay, how do we what what processes and systems are we put in place? We know the organization as well as possible because you're right. It's like, okay, you have a half a dozen different organizations that you're working on at any given point in time. And that could be, that could be a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but to get down to it, um, you know, the, the, the idea is that we're, we really service organizations that couldn't hire their own CISO by themselves. It just, they, it's just cost prohibitive to them. Um, you know, I mean, a larger organization, you know, you can say, well, and, and, and by that, I'm assuming that a qualified CISO is someone that's, They've been in the they've been in the industry for five years. They have a CISM or a CISSP. They're probably going to cost their organization at a minimum 150 US dollars a year or 150 thousand US dollars a year. Mm. Um, and and when you look at a you know when you look at a, an organization with say 250 employees, um, so we we service mainly banks and credit unions. They they have a lot of challenges. They have to have a chief information security officer, but they can't afford that. 
So thanks very much for uh, watching CC Talks. We hope to see you again soon.